My message today is what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for, right? How many of you guys have a hard time waiting, right? You're like, God did not give me the gift of patience because I'm not a doctor, so I don't have patience, right? <laughs> See what I did there, right? <laughs> I'm not here to do dad jokes, but um, I believe that you guys are here for a reason, and I just want to thank you guys for joining us here today. I believe that God wants to communicate his heart to you guys, and uh, I'm just going to pray that he does that here today, and it wouldn't just be me today. So, uh, Jesus, we thank you, God, for today. We thank you, God, that you are our way maker. Uh, we thank you, God, that you brought us here uh, to our church here for such a time as this. Father God, I pray that you would speak through me in a mighty way today. God, that um, I would communicate your heartbeat to your people here today. And God, that we would leave here changed to become more like you today. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Um, Palm Sunday is today, so happy Palm Sunday. Um, how many of you guys know what Palm Sunday is? You've heard of it. You've probably been in church, right? I grew up Catholic, so they would give me like a string of palm branches, and then they're like, hey, you need to make this into a cross. And I'm like eight at the time. I'm like, I am not good at origami, so I don't know how to do that. So here, mom, you make it for me, right? <laughs> it was crazy. But Palm Sunday is a great Sunday. It leads us up to next week, which is our Easter service celebration. Um, and I believe there's some things today that God wants to reveal to help prep us for Easter next week. Amen. Um, Luke chapter 19, 28 through 31. Uh, we're going to start there. Um, and it says, When he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. Okay, um, so those who were sent went away and found it just as, they, just as he had told them. And they were untying the colt, and its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing on their, col their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near already the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And when some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Come on. It's so good right? Um, what do we know so far in this, in this uh, account of Jesus? We know that uh, the town that Jesus heads towards, it's the same place that he raised Lazarus from the dead. You guys remember that story, that account? If you haven't heard of it, Lazarus is a good friend of Jesus, and he dies, and like three days later, Jesus comes and raises him from the dead. It's a great story, uh, amazing miracle that Jesus does in the life of Lazarus. Um, some came because they heard Jesus do this great miracle, right? Um, when, Jesus is, when Jesus arrives, he fulfills the prophecy found in Zechariah 9.9, 9, and he arrives not in force or with violence, but rather in humility, right? And why was that a problem? I think that was a problem because the, the Israelites were looking for a ruler that would come in force, and he'd come in like, hey, I'm going to kick the door down and punch you in the teeth, and I'm, I'm the Messiah, right? But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus came in humility, not in violence or with force. Uh, moving on to 41, it says, And when he drew near, he saw the city, and he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation." Great message for today, right? It's, um, it breaks my heart that like um, Jesus riding on that colt would know that, hey, a few days from now, these people are praising me now, but a few days from now, they're going to turn on me, right? And it just breaks the Lord's heart, right? Um, so why, do, why palm branches? Why couldn't it be like, um, I don't know, like grape leaves, right? That's kind of, kind of a weird situation. But palm branches were used as a symbol of victory, of triumph, of peace, and eternal life. Palms, along with other tree branches, are part of the Feast of Tabernacles or of booths. So why is this important for us to know today, right? I think there are, there's, some, there are some things that you need to remember here in this season of Palm Sunday. And I said Psalm Sunday, so that's really great. Uh, spelling really works for me. Um, <laughs> I was like, great. It's going up on the screen. So the first way, 
that we remember Psalm Sunday, um, <laughs> is we make this a season of extravagant praise to the king, right? How many of you guys have something to praise God about today? Come on. Um, I was like, I was thinking about this the other day. I'm like, man, like, the, the times that I feel depressed, the times that I feel anxious, the times where I feel like down on myself, man, like, um, does God think that about me, right? Does God want me to be there in that situation? No, like there's, there's reasons in my life where I can praise God for the things that I have, right? I mean, I have arms and legs and a working body. I'm breathing air, right? I mean, um, that alone I can praise God for, amen? My job, I can praise God for that. I can praise God for my family. I can praise God for uh, the friends I have. I can praise God for the situation that I'm in, the town I'm in. Like um, when you start shifting your perspective to offer praise to God for the things that he's given you, then your perspective shifts. Things start to change in your life, right? You're like, man, I don't know why I'm happy. Like I shouldn't be happy, but my perspective has changed, right? Um, Psalm 139, 13 through 14 says, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. So that alone, like God knew um, what you needed to be you, right? And he, he made you, formed you in your mother's womb, and, and you're here today, right? That's alone. You can praise God for that, right? Because God knows you, right? Um, Psalm 105, oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make, his, uh, make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. So if we're seeking God, we need to rejoice, right? In every situation, right? No matter what comes our way, right? Alistair Begg says this great quote that I think we need to pause on for a minute. If we should neglect to give God the honor and the praise he is due, we risk forgetting the glorious ways he continues to pursue us even today. Man, like, to know that the God of the universe who created everything by speaking it, like, pursues us today is reason enough I need to praise God. Amen? Like, like, and regardless of the situation you find yourself in today, regardless of how much you think you've blown it, how much you think that you're, you're too lost for God to use, like, God still pursues us today. Amen? I'm like, I'm getting Jesus pimples, right? It's like, <laughs> Jesus goosebumps, right? Because I'm like, God doesn't need me at the end of the day, Right? Like, but God like, pursues me in a way where I'm like, God wants me, right? God wants us, right? He wants us to, and you're laughing, right? It's awesome. Um, but like that, that alone should be reason to praise God, right? Um, but if we forget or if we neglect to give God the honor and the praise he is due, we risk forgetting the glorious ways in which he pursues us, right? Um, number two, make it a season of recognizing his timing, how many of you guys like God's timing a lot of times? No, I don't. <laughs> I have a hard enough time waiting for uh, the microwave to cook my food, right? Come on. Have you, okay, side note, have you ever looked at a box of Pop-Tarts, all right? A box of Pop-Tarts has uh, the toaster instructions, then they have microwave instructions, right? And the microwave instructions are like three seconds for a Pop-Tart, right? I can't wait three seconds for a Pop-Tart, right? <laughs> so God's timing is perfect, right? Um, Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So timing is everything. Jesus was coming at the right time, right? And sometimes it's like, well, I want God to move quicker in my life. Been there? Been there? Yeah. I want God to, to move. Like, I, I'm asking God to, to, for this thing, and I want it right now, Right? You guys ever done that before? <laughs> uh, Jeremiah 8, 7, even the stork in the heavens knows her times, and the turtle dove, the swallow, and the crane keep the time of their coming, but my people know not the rules of the Lord. So timing is everything, right? Um, pull my notes out here. There are signs all around us that God is coming back, right? We see like rumors of war. We see natural disasters happen. We see like people fighting with each other, right? It's like a lot of it's like can be really stressful, right? A lot of it can be really crazy, right? Um, but my question to you today is are you preparing for God's coming, right? Are you preparing for him to come back? I remember reading a book uh, when I was younger about these two boys that this captain leaves on an island, right? And the captain's like, I'm gonna be back for you. So stay on this island, but don't go into the jungle because the jungle um, is, is gray. And if you go into there, you're gonna become like the jungle, right? 
And so the boys at first, they're like, okay, I'm just gonna chill outside on the sand waiting for the captain to come back, right? And so day after day, they're waiting. The captain's not coming back. We're still waiting. One of the boys is like, is he ever gonna come back? Like, he's just left us here. He's abandoned us here, right? And so I'm gonna go into the jungle. I'm just gonna go like inch by inch in the jungle. And it's, it's kind of nice over here in the jungle. Then we come back. But slowly over time, that boy knew that, or that boy started to turn gray and become like the jungle, right? And soon the boy just disappeared into the jungle and didn't return, right? And the boy that was faithful, the boy was standing on the edge, saw the captain come back and knew that Jesus, like it's, it's, it's like Jesus coming back for us, right? So many times we're like, God, when are you coming back? Like I hear all these rumors of war, there's natural disasters happening. God, like I'm tired of it. I wanna, I wanna go to heaven, right? I wanna, I wanna go home, right? But God has kept us here for such a time as this um, because, like, how many guys know that there's people that need to know the Lord, right. right? There's people that, like, God is patiently waiting for them to come to relationship with him. And if he comes back like that, they're going to miss an opportunity to know Jesus, right? They're going to miss an opportunity to turn and repent from their sins. So it's remembering that God's timing is perfect. God, God wants um, to give people enough time to repent and come to him. Number three, make it a season to give God what he needs. It's kind of weird because you're like, what does God need from me, right? Like, God has everything that he ever wants, right? Um, I look at the account of Palm Sunday, and I notice there were people that had to trust the words that, that Jesus told them to do, right? The, the owner of the cult had to trust that, hey, these guys were going to take this cult that's unridden before, and they're going to return it, right? How many guys can do that, right? You're like, well, if I give that guy my boat, I don't know if I'm going to get it back in time or I'm going to get it back in one piece, right? If I give the youth group my car, am I going to get it back in one piece, right? <laughs> nope, you're not. <laughs> then you're just sowing a seed in the youth group, right? Um, the disciples had to, had to leave everything to trust Jesus and follow him, right? Like on their biggest payday, right? They haul in this giant, like, like huge, cast, or huge uh, catch of fish, right? And Jesus says, drop everything and follow me right? They had to trust him, right? Um, and so, like, what does God need, right? What does God need? I think he needs, like, your heart. Like, he doesn't need the things you have, right? He doesn't, like, like God is fully sustainable, right? Um, but, like, whatever your heart craves and whatever your heart desires, if it's not God, he wants that, you know? I think it's gold, right? Um, number four, we need to make it a season to trust him more, I think that's hard a lot of times for us because it's like, well, God's asking me to step out and I don't know, it's scary because I don't know what's gonna happen at the end, right? You guys ever done that before? You're like, well, if I do this, then this is gonna happen and this is gonna happen this is gonna happen and then I'm gonna get hurt. Have you guys ever been betrayed before? Right? I used to, uh, I used to have this saying that said, I don't want you to stab me in the back, I want you to stab me in the face, right? Why, you're like, why does anybody have to get stabbed? <laughs> at all, right? <laughs> but I, for me, I'm like, I'd rather you say something mean to me to my face rather than behind my back. But I picture Jesus like riding on that colt through the town where people are like saying, Hosanna, praise the king, like giving him all the glory and honor. And he knows that days from now, they're gonna do the complete opposite, right? And that's, that's hard. Like, I think that's part of the reason why it broke God's heart. It broke Jesus' heart because he's like, man, if you knew my timing and when I was coming, you would be different. You would act different, right? Billy Graham says this great quote, learn to commit every situation to God and trust him for the outcome. God's love for you never changes. It never changes. It never changes. It never changes, right? Um, no matter what problems you face or how unsettled life becomes, right? That's, that can give me a little bit of hope, right? Knowing that God knows your situation which came in here carrying today, and he knows that no matter what comes your way, trust him with the outcome, right? Yeah. Trusting Jesus requires us to trust them even when it feels hard, right? Pastor Alex, um, I don't think God would ask me to change anything about my life, right? You guys ever said that before? I ask God to open a door. You guys ever hear say that to yourself? I ask God to open a door and I'm gonna walk through it until the next door closes, right? But trusting Jesus is being obedient to what he tells us to do and that's our highest calling. 
So the condition of your heart, where is your heart at today? I know there's things that you're like, man, I've been saving for 20 years for this, uh, really, th- this house I want or this, this boat or whatever your heart desires. I've been, I've been like trying to be faithful with that or I've been like, um, I've been faithful with this thing God's given me, right? But if God asks you to give it, how willing are you to give it today? Right? I think it's like that nothing would replace the position that God would have in our lives. Where like you place nothing over God, right? No matter like how hard it is, and it's hard, right? It's hard to like give up something that you really love, right? That's what obedience is, right? We saw the disciples give up their careers, right? And they didn't make a lot of money, right? Following Jesus, right? Some of them like died really bad, bad deaths, right? Not like they, they fell in the street and got ran over by a car. Like they got boiled in oil and they got crucified upside down. They got beheaded all because they're being obedient to what God has called them to do. And where, where do you guys sit today with that? Because um, we, can, we can just go, come to church and be like, oh yeah, that was a good message. Yeah, Pastor Alex did good. It was great. I'm gonna take it to heart, right? And then I'm gonna go decorate eggs this week and it's gonna be great. Um, or you can like sit there and be like, okay, God, like what, what has a hold of my heart today? Like what am I pursuing that's above you? And if it's anything other than Jesus, then God, like I give you whatever it is because God, you're worth it, right? That, that God, like if I do not worship you with everything that I have, then the stones are gonna cry out and they're gonna worship, right? Because they know how great you are. They know how powerful you are. Isn't that, wouldn't that be sad, guys, if like rocks decide to cry out and we're like, Oh, yeah, it's cool. Waymaker, right? Like, <laughs> it's silly, right? Like, I mean, like, think about your life and think about, like, what God has done for you guys, and then how can you praise him with everything that you have today, right? I'm like, and I just don't want to go a day without praising God for everything that he's done in my life, you know? And you get the guilt trip. You're like, man, like, I should be praising God more in my life, Right? I don't think that's what God does. God's like, hey, just give me what you have today. Whatever you're pursuing, I want that thing. So, four things that you, we should remember in this season. Number one, make it a season of extravagant praise to the king. So no matter what you're going through, you can praise him in that season, right? If it's a good season, you can praise him. If it's a bad season, you can praise him. Number two, make it a season to recognize his timing, that God doesn't work on our timeline. God works in his timeline, and we just need to recognize when he arrives in our town and we need to praise him with everything we have number three we need to make it a season to give god what he needs so whatever your heart has give him that right and place nothing above him right and number four we need to make it a season to trust him more right and that's that's difficult but we can do it right i believe that we can do it okay so let me pray for you and then i got pastor trav coming up here we're going to transition to another part of our service um thank you guys for being here I don't know if you guys are like, well, I just rolled out of bed and walked in here, but I believe you guys are here for a reason. I believe you guys are here because God wants to speak to you and move. And it's not just a regular church service. We're not like, oh, it's just we go through the motions. I believe like the King of Kings wants to meet with you today and wants to change your life today, right? And so we just want to give him all the praise today. So um, if you're struggling with any of those things, uh, come talk to us here today. Uh, we would love to pray with you and, and help, help you in this here today. So Jesus, we thank you, God. Um, God, for who you are, man, like, it just blows my mind that, God, you, you do so many things we take for granted every day, um, the breath in our lungs, God, the fact that we woke up, God, and your judgment didn't kill us last night um, is a reason enough where I can praise you. Um, God, I, I tell this to our students all the time, like, you positioned our earth um, so close to the sun that if it was any closer, um, our planet would burn up, and if it was any further away, um, our planet would turn into a ball of ice. So, like, the simple fact that you, you know us so well that you put us here. Um, and, God, we just give you all the praise for everything we have. Um, God, regardless of what our heart desires today, God, we would um, reposition our heart today to praise nothing else but you here today. God, that whatever we're craving, whatever we're desiring, whatever thing that we want, that we're, like, itching, we're saving up for, God, I pray that you would shift that. And, God, that we would be willing to give that thing that you're asking us to give. Like the gentleman who gave his colt, um, trusting that the disciples would bring it back. Um, God, we do that in our lives here today. And God, we thank you for your timing and how you're waiting for people to come into relationship with you. And God, that you can use us to help with that. 
Um, and God, that we can just trust you more in our lives here today. God, that knowing that you love us, that you're never going to leave us, you're never going to forsake us. God, that your plans for us are amazing. And God, that you created us in such a way where we can worship you with everything that we have today. Father God, I praise you uh, for your goodness, and we love you so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Pastor Trev. Thank you, Pastor Alex, for the challenge this morning. Yeah. Love you, bro. Love you. We, uh, we enter into Palm Sunday, right? And Pastor Alex talks about the, that Jesus came into Jerusalem. And, and I love the fact, and I, I'm not here to recap his message, but I want you to, to catch this in this next part, is that they, they laid palm branches down and their coats down because they were recognizing the king. They came to recognize the royalty, that, that they thought this is the, that what they've been waiting for. This is what's been written about for hundreds of years, right? That, that finally in this moment, we have our king. Finally, we have the guy that's going to take over and rescue us and deliver us. And then in a couple of days, he sits them down at a table and tells them he's going to die. Now, it's easy for us to see on the other side because we have the full story, right? We get to see the record of of what happened and the resurrection, which we're going to celebrate next week. And we're going to have fun with that. And we're going to, we literally are going to throw a party because why not? The resurrection is amazing. That's the crux, the the crucifixion and the resurrection is the crux of our faith. Without it, we do everything in vain, right? So we are going to celebrate that. But I want you to pause for a minute because then see what happened. He sits them down at a table for a feast. And that table, for that feast, was called the Passover feast. Now, I know some of you guys are really familiar with Jewish Passovers because you read and study your Bible really hard. Some of us are like, I don't even know what that means. But let me tell you what the Passover feast signified. They came to Jerusalem to be a part and to be together for the Passover feast. And this is a recollection back to when the people of Egypt enslaved the Israelites. And they were trying to get out of it. And God was demonstrating his mighty power. And God says, fine, then this is what we're going to do. We're going to kill the firstborn son because Pharaoh will not listen And so God told the Israelites, put the blood of a lamb on the doorpost. And when the angel of death comes to your house, it will pass over. See, oftentimes we just read stuff and we just like, oh, that's cool. That's a nice name for it. But so from that moment, they saw that the blood of the lamb spared the life of the child. Man, now imagine they're sitting at the table with the Lamb of God, who is spreading his blood so that the angel of death passes over you and I. (laughs) That's amazing. But see, we have to go back to what Pastor Alex said is we had to, they had to recognize his timing. Because they sat there and and they're like, dude, we're going to, we're going to break the bread and we're going to drink the wine. And you're talking about your body being broken for us. And you're talking about your blood being spilled out for us. And they didn't understand it. They didn't get it. Because they didn't have the full story like we do. We take communion and we celebrate what we know. But they were sitting there trying to recognize God's timing. Right? They were praising him. They were worshiping Hosanna. You know, he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then a few days later, he's betrayed, his body broken, his blood spilled on the greatest and the fulfillment of the Passover. See, the timing to them was off, but not for us, not for God, and not for the world. See, the timing was perfect. The timing was perfect, even though we didn't see it. And so in a minute, we're going we're gonna to take communion And you're like, wait, we don't have anything. Somebody didn't put them out. We're not ready to rip the thingies yet. It's all right. We know that. Some overachiever in the audience is like, somebody somebody help pastor. He doesn't have the communion envelopes up there. They didn't have them out there in the foyer. We know that. We know that. But we're going to take some symbols of the body and a broken body. And we're going to take a symbol of a cup that has grape juice in it of the blood that's poured out for you and I. And see, oftentimes, like, like Pastor Alex said, we live in a microwave society where we can't wait three seconds for a toaster oven to, to work, right? We, that's just too, that's too, I can't even wait three seconds for the microwave, so I'll just eat it cold, right? 
I can't go through McDonald's because McDonald's might take a minute and 20 seconds, and they're supposed to take a minute and 10, you know? It's like, that's, that's what we do. And I don't want to rush through communion, right? I want to take a moment, and you guys say, well, I don't, I don't know what communion is, and I'm going to walk us through that. Because 1 Corinthians, I don't know if you, if, if you know this or not, but 1 Corinthians was probably documented before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So Paul is referencing what he knows in 1 Corinthians. And he says, for I have received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Man, so we think about that. You say, so that's the point of taking communion. That's why we do it. We do it to remember what Christ did for us. And you know, as a pastor's kid, and like I said earlier, Ray, can, he can vouch for me. He saw me do it. As a pastor's kid, when you're younger, we used to actually do like wafers in the dish and then fill the cups individually. The pastor's kid day, man, like handful of wafers after service and finishing off the grape juice. Oh, don't think I didn't, right? <laughs> right, Ray? <laughs> well, see, sometimes we miss the significance. I don't want to miss the significance of what we're doing this morning. I don't want to rush through it and just go, oh, yeah, we're going to play a song. We're going to rip this. And we're going to eat it. And we're going to drink it. But first, we need to get right with Jesus. First, we need to get right. And anybody in this, in this room, and if you're watching online, you want to partake online, you can do it too. Anybody can partake in communion. Okay, but the Bible is clear that, that when we come to the Lord's table, that we should be clean and pure before him, that we should be ready to take communion. And so if you're like, ah, I don't want to take communion, that's okay. You don't have to come forward and get an emblem. But if you want to take communion, you're welcome to. But first, we have to get right with the Lord. So I want to say a, a, a simple prayer, and this is what the Bible says, that if we admit that we've sinned, that we've fallen short of the glory of God, and we confess that, we say, God, I, I'm a sinner and I need you. And we believe that his work on the cross is good for us, that his salvation is available for us, then we're saved. That's what the Bible says. So I'm going to pray a prayer, and then we're going to sing a song. And during the song, we're going to have the, the ushers come up, and they'll have the emblems in the, in the containers, and you can just come up during the song and take one and then take it back to your seat. But if this is you this morning and you say, hey, pastor, i got to get right before the Lord before we take communion, pray this with me. Heavenly Father. I pray that you would cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Lord, you know that we are not perfect. You know that we do not walk a path that is pleasing in your eyes all the time. And God, I ask you humbly for myself and for those praying with me, Lord, that you would purify us, forgive us of our sins, extend mercy and grace like you do, that we may come and sit at the table and eat with the Lamb. Lord, we're going to do this in remembrance of what you've done on the cross because we know that by your body that was broken and your blood that was shed, we are saved. And so, God, we ask that you would put us in a right spot before you while we take communion this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing. So as you gathered the guys around the table, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. There's two parts of communion that we need to understand and, under, and know this morning. That the body was broken for us, and his body was broken for our restoration. Maybe here, but for sure in heaven. Without the broken body of Christ, we have no hope of a restoration. We rock, walk around sick, we walk around lame, we walk around half or incomplete. But with the broken body of Christ, there's full restoration possible. And so when he, break, he breaks the bread, he says that we can eat it because his body was broken for us. The scripture also says that by his stripes, we're healed. We prayed that prayer over my dad many, many times. That by his stripes, we're healed restoration is possible. As we take the, and eat the bread this morning, if that's you or you're standing in for a family member, you say, I need healing. 
I need restoration. Remember that as we eat together. Let's eat. Thank you, Lord. It says in the same manner he took the cup. He said, this is my blood which is poured out for you for the forgiveness or the remission of sin. So the broken body gives us the restoration and the healing and the blood of the lamb gives us forgiveness. I don't know about you, but I need some blood of the lamb in my life to wash over and forgive the things that I can't forgive myself. So when we drink this morning, remember that forgiveness is offered to you through the blood of Christ. Revelation says they'll, they'll be saved by the blood of the lamb and the word of the testimony. So let's testify together as we drink to the forgiveness of God through his blood. Father, we thank you for an opportunity to celebrate you because without you, we're lost. Without you, we're hopeless. But with you, we're alive in Christ because of your death, burial, and resurrection. And next week, we get to celebrate the awesome resurrection power and story. But God, we don't want to miss the sacrifice, the payment that you made on our behalf. Lord, I ask that as we partake of the bread and the broken body, that there would be healing God, I pray for the forgiveness of sins through your blood, that we would come to know and understand these things, that it wouldn't just be a, a token of a piece of bread or a little bit of juice or a Sunday thing, but God, we would live out a life transformed through the power of the cross and through the power of the resurrection. God, I thank you that we were worth it, that you never stopped pursuing us, that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Man, thank you for spending a little bit of time with us in communion. We're going to go out singing in a minute. But I just want to challenge you. And I said this last week, and so please, it's what it is. There's people that are Christers, all right? They come for Christmas and Easter. I'm just calling it out as it is. And we love them. I don't, want any, I don't want anybody to think that we don't. We want them to come to church on those two Sundays. So we expect the, them to come, but here's my challenge to you. Go outside of your box with a family member, a friend, a neighbor. Your responsibility is to open your mouth and invite somebody. It's not to convict them or to, to make them make a decision. It's simply to be that witness to them, to be that. So I challenge everybody in the room and online to, to invite somebody to come to church with you next week. Be a bringer. You know what? What's the worst they can say? No? All right, you're still going to come, right? You're still going to see lovely faces that stood by you, right? So push yourself outside your comfort zone a little bit, and let's go out expecting God and appreciating and praising the King for what he's done in our life. Thank you for being here this morning.